I don't know anything about tech. Um, and and as you'll notice, we're being recorded uh, so that people who weren't able to be here tonight can watch this at a later date. So let me and, welcome everybody. And, I'll just, gonna, and oh. I'll just interject that it's time for all of us except our speakers to mute ourselves. Welcome everybody. It's nice to see your faces. Um, this is our first uh, Wednesday night schmooze after our period for about a month of holidays. So it's kind of feels a little bit rusty, but a little bit nice getting back uh, into the swing of things. Um, tonight, we're gonna have a very interesting conversation thanks to uh, Judy Hoberman, who has been working to try to bring Connect, uh, the organization we'll be talking about, to, uh, or bring Becky to Connect. I was gonna say bring Connect to Becky, but really to bring Becky to Connect. Um, and Connect is uh, an organization, a multi-faith, multi-faith, multiracial, urban and suburban group made up of 37 congregations that organize together to take action on issues of common concern to their communities and the greater good. And our speaker tonight um, will be Matt McDermott, who's the lead organizer for Connect. Matt has led Connect through set many successful campaigns on issues as varied as immigration rights, health insurance rates, criminal justice reform, police accountability, and numerous local issues. Uh, Matt's gonna talk tonight about the mission of Connect, the social justice issues it is working on and the process of member organizations working together to make decisions, the process of becoming a member of congregation and the responsibilities that would come with that. And a hearty welcome to you, Matt, and thank you so much for being here tonight. And I also want to introduce Alana Rosenberg, who is um, a member of Temp Temple Emmanuel in Orange, and she has been active with Connect's criminal justice reform team and clean slate legislative campaign. And she's here to talk about, the, give us the perspective of what's it like being a, a congregation that is involved with Connect. So um, I'm very grateful that both of you are here tonight and let's get started, Matt. Um, and we're all eager to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you, Shoshana. And thank you everybody for, for being here and, and uh, inviting us and Judy for making this happen. Um, I, uh, Shana Tova, I feel honored to be the first schmooze of the season. That's exciting. Um, uh, so I'm Matt McDermott. I'm the lead organizer of Connect. I am, uh, I've been here now with the organization for about nine years. Um, it's gone by in a flash. It's hard to believe. I'm born and raised and originally from Chicago. Uh, a Midwest kid, went to college in Michigan uh, and got a taste of community organizing uh, right after I finished college and was headed back to Chicago with a history degree and no, no great plan of uh, what the heck I was going to do with that liberal, liberal arts degree. Um, and about five years later, um, I actually got an opportunity to begin organizing as a profession um, on the southwest side of Chicago. And, and that was... Uh, 1999. So I've been doing this kind of work uh, first in the greater Chicago area and now in Connecticut for, for 22 years. Um, and some of my first exposure was much more issue-based campaigns that were community organizing. But uh, when I began actually doing community organizing professionally, it was with an organization that was congregation-based. Um, and I grew up as a Catholic kid. My folks were uh, very serious Catholics on multiple levels, serious in their, in their observance, but serious in the way they carried those values into the world. Um, so we were in church every Sunday and every, every, every holy day and every year of grade and high school. Um, uh, but um, they also uh, took that seriously in terms of uh, wanting to change the world and, and uh, make it a better place for themselves and for for all of us. So, um, so doing the work of community organizing when I found the opportunity to begin to do it with congregations felt a little bit like coming home, a little bit like working with people who I uh, knew something about, um, having grown up in the church and in a very vibrant uh, parish life. Um, fast forward a lot of years and a lot of backstory that I won't go into. Um, my wife and I are, uh, my wife is Jewish. We have a Jewish household. We have two Jewish daughters. We actually were members of Becky briefly when we first arrived in, in town um, due to recommendations from friends in Chicago who'd spent 
uh, their time here at Yale, you know, doing medical school um, and eventually found that we felt our home was, uh, you know, better at, at uh, Mishkan Israel. So that's where we've been for a number of years. And, um, uh, but I've, I've, you know, both on a personal level and a professional level really uh, enjoyed doing this work with all kinds of congregations, but especially synagogues, um, just because of the personal connection to my, my family tradition now. So I'm gonna do a screen share and show you about seven or eight slides. I will try to keep that very brief and, and then uh, allow Alana some time to, to just share her experience and then allow hopefully a lot of time for just conversation and question and answer. Um, and, and Shoshana has already covered a few of the basics uh, of what I will share. So that can make it even faster. Does that sound all right? Um, there, can folks see that okay? Great. Um, so uh, just a, a, a slight note, CONNECT obviously is an acronym. You can see the full name there, but I would just have you note that it's in English and Spanish. And as the organization was founded a little less than 10 years ago, we're gonna have our 10th anniversary at the end of November this year. Um, the fact that it translated into Spanish in the same order as an acronym was of some importance to founding leaders because we have had the good fortune to have uh, a strong Latino presence, especially from the what was St. Rose of Lima Catholic Church in, in uh, New Haven now is merged to Our Lady of Guadalupe over in the Fairhaven neighborhood. Um, so Connect, as Shoshana said, is 37 congregations and institutions representing about 30,000 people. It's very broad based in multiple ways, racially, religiously, uh, urban and suburban, geographically, right? Our geography is greater New Haven, greater Bridgeport, greater Norwalk, um, uh, effectively, um, and lots of suburban towns up and down and in between. I would say lots of moderates uh, with some liberals and some conservatives, right? A lot of the folks that are most active in Connect are folks that aren't necessarily heavily ideologically driven, but are, are, are uh, heavily interested in getting things done and, and trying to be practical about how to get things done. We're nonpartisan um, and we're multi-issue. We weren't set up to be an organization to work on criminal justice or healthcare or any specific thing as much as to be responsive to the interests and needs and, and problems and pressures that affect the families in our membership. Um, but clearly the focus is on systemic change and social justice as opposed to charity. That's not an indictment of charity. All of our member congregations do charity work of various kinds um, and most of them do it very well and very earnestly. It's really that we didn't, that we didn't feel a need to duplicate that work or to amplify that work. What we felt a need uh, and we're called to do is to help congregations properly get into social justice work and to be able to do that consistently and persistently and effectively over time, which is very hard for any one congregation to be able to do. Um, what we do in Connect, uh, uh, hopefully I'll be able to put some life to this, but uh, one of the most basic and most important things we do is build relationships, right? To have that multiracial, multi-faith, uh, broad membership doesn't just happen. It happens through a lot of hard work and getting to know people, getting people to be honest with one another, getting people to um, share across lines that typically in our society are, are dividing lines and lines of division. So a big emphasis is, is on relationship building and listening to one another. We're interested in, in developing leaders and we spend a lot of time doing training, uh, uh, literal like classroom style training or now Zoom, Zoom sessions <laughs> training. Um, but you know, talking to people about how to be effective in uh, community organizing and to be effective in their congregations and communities, and then actually trying to practice that with people, right, on the job training, so to speak, when we're doing meetings, assemblies, committee meetings, uh, there's, there's opportunity for learning and leadership development in almost everything we do. And we try to do that by doing preparation, small preparation meetings, actually doing a meeting, whether that's an internal meeting or a meeting with the mayor or a meeting with the governor, and then evaluating afterward, talking about how did it go? What can we learn from how that went? Um, who did well? Who could step up and be stronger next time, et cetera, et cetera. 
we're interested in strengthening congregations. That's another aspect of our work that I don't think, um, you know, is out front as much um, as maybe it could be or should be. But we're not just interested in pulling energy and talent and resources out of congregations to do work in the broader world. We're interested in the long term strength and vitality of the congregations themselves as institutions. We think making, uh, giving congregations an opportunity to be effective on so social justice and systemic change, it can be important to helping congregations thrive, right? Giving people a sense that not only uh, do I have a spiritual home and a community, but I have a community that's effective and can stand up for me and my family and our greater community when it needs to. Um, but we're also interested in using some of that training, using some of those tools, using those listening skills and relationship building skills to help congregations thrive if and when they need that help, or if and when they want our, our help. So by invitation and when it seems appropriate, uh, we'll work with congregations on internal strategies um, at their direction. And then last, of course, but not least, we're interested in taking action and making an impact, right? Not just talking about social justice, not just talking about systemic change, but actually um, seeing some proof in the pudding and getting things done that matter to real people and not just real people out there somewhere who you know, are in statistics that we know they live here somewhere in Connecticut, but real people who we know, real people who we've talked to, real people who we've engaged in the fight themselves for that change. Uh, you know, most of often who come right out of our congregations, but sometimes also who come along the way um, to work with us on a campaign that we may have begun. So um, I'll give you a quick rundown. Again, Shoshana touched on some of these, but some of our impact, some examples of our impact, uh, uh, I think Alana will talk some more about Clean Slate, but I will talk a little bit more about Clean Slate. That's one of our big wins that we finally just uh, got done uh, at the end of the spring, beginning of the summer, where Governor Lamont signed just the fourth clean slate bill in the country into law um, that uh, experts estimate could help between two to 300,000 people in the state of Connecticut to get their criminal records expunged. Um, and uh, if you know anything about living with a criminal record, you may know that it's an incredible scarlet letter that leaves people as a second class citizen where they have a terribly much more difficult time getting jobs, uh, getting housing, going to further their education, getting licenses. Um, so uh, licenses, I mean, to open businesses and perform professional functions. Um, so Clean Slate, uh, we're really excited about. Um, it will not fully go into effect until the beginning of 2023, but it's now the law and we're at the stage of beginning to talk to key state bureauc bureaucrats about how to make that happen and get all their clunky old computer systems talking to each other so it can actually be automated. Um, early on in the life of the organization, we did a lot of work around immigrants and uh, the undocumented and led campaigns uh, in 2011 and then 2013 around in-state tuition to allow young people who lived here and went, went to high school here who were undocumented to be able to get in-state tuition rates at the state university system, which for many meant the difference between being able to afford to go to college and not. Um, in 2013, we ran a campaign and changed the state law to allow undocumented people to get a driver's license, um, which in effect meant them meant they were also able to uh, register their car properly and buy insurance properly. Um, uh, I haven't checked the numbers, but as of uh, I have numbers recently, but um, most recent number from about two years ago that I know of was about 80,000 people now in Connecticut have that driver's license, um, enabling them to drive legally and hopefully safely. Um, anyway, I could go on and on about probably any one of these on this list. I won't belabor the point. I'm happy to answer questions about any of them. But just to give you an idea of the varied nature of what we've done, um, there's a list there. And then I, maybe I'll just hold up at the end of the bottom there, local issues, right? Some of the things at the top are big, broad state level issues and pretty quickly in Connecticut, when you get outside of town politics, but we you go straight up to the state. Um, but we uh, are concerned and interested when there are local issues that, that arise that people wanna work on in their hometown, in one town or with a handful of congregations in one area. So an example of that is Slice Pizza. It was a pizza bar in Hamden that was the site of a lot of shootings, assaults, uh, drug dealing, um, 
uh, not far from the Southern Connecticut State University campus. Um, and after the tragic shooting death of one of the leaders of Connect, uh, I'm sorry, one of the sons, a son of one of our longtime leaders who lives in New Haven, um, we got, we, we learned of what all was going on at Slice and went after them and got their liquor license revoked and ultimately got them shut down. We have a team working on asthma issues right now in New Haven because asthma is so prevalent and we've heard so many stories from people young and old in our congregations about their struggles with asthma or the struggles of their kids with asthma. So anyway, you get the idea. Sometimes we are, or, or we, we keep open the possibility of working on local issues where there's an interest and where there's an opportunity um, and where there's leadership. Um, and then one other thing to say about kind of how we work uh, is to think about our work as a cycle, uh, as opposed to a linear advocacy mode where we go from kind of deciding an issue to going after an issue to uh, you know trying to win that issue and starting back over. We think of it as cyclical, that we begin with the listening work, the relationship building work to identify key themes, key concerns, uh, go into a mode of a team working on research and learning and trying to figure out what might we do to take action, to be responsive to those concerns. Uh, we then take action. Uh, and then just like I talked about in the, in the process of leadership development, we take time after action and along the way to try to do evaluation and reflection so that we learn more about the issue. We learn more about how to be effective. We learn individually about how to hopefully become better and stronger and more effective leaders. Um, and it comes back again to relationship building. Um, on Clean Slate, just for a quick example, Clean Slate was not something I'd ever heard of. I don't think any leader in Connect had ever heard of. Um, Clean Slate for us came out of a listening campaign we did at the beginning of 2018, where we had a, about a thousand people across all the member congregations of Connect participate in small group discussions inside their own congregations, listening and interested in the kinds of concerns and problems and pressures that affect their families. Um, and in that campaign, we heard for the first time a theme around criminal justice and specifically around criminal records and the way people have been held back by criminal records. So we formed a criminal, after that campaign was wrapped up and we had that data and we had a team sifting through all those notes from those conversations, we formed a criminal justice reform team to begin to respond to those concerns and invite the people who had shared those stories to come to the table and help us figure out, well, what do we do? What would be practical? And it was that criminal justice reform team that learned about Clean Slate, of the concept and you know, got on the phone and talked to the folks out of Philadelphia who were kind of the innovators of that idea and passed the first law in Pennsylvania back in 2018. And eventually we did the work internally, had a lot of conversations with member congregations and the strategy team and decided, yes, let's work on that. That will be the issue for this team and one of the important issues for the organization. So then we went into action, right? Having done the relationship building work, the listening work, the research work, the internal conversations and then and then into action. And I will just show you an example. So the first action we did, well, actually I lied. This is the second action. Um, in October of 2018, when Ned Lamont was still a candidate for governor, we had 800 people come together uh, at, uh, this is congregation B'nai Israel in Bridgeport on Park Avenue. Um, so we had their sanctuary um, opened as if it were the high holy days and um, filled with people and had candidates for governor, um, attorney general and treasurer come. And we asked them very specific questions. Uh, and, and this is Osti Jackson and Lonnie Spaulding asking Ned Lamont, if you get elected, will you support a clean slate policy? Um, to which he basically gave a milk toast, mealy mouth, maybe answer. Um, so uh, we persisted, um, and this is uh, two years later uh, in the basement of Mount Airy Baptist Church um, on a January night that was very cold outside, but that room got to probably be about 85 degrees. It was so packed with about 600 people, um, and Ned Lamont at that point is committing, not only will he support Clean Slate, he will be introducing his own bill um, to... Uh, you know, his own version of Clean Slate on behalf of his administration. Um, so 
that's a couple of examples or moments of action where uh, we've pers we persisted and, and eventually got the job done and got that law passed. So last slide, uh, last but not least, um, uh, I know people wanted to talk practically. What, is, what would it be like? What would it mean for Becky to be a member of Connect? And, and um, uh, I, I think Shoshana, uh, you know, the way you said it is right, right? It's Becky, it's kind of a two-way street. Um, so we think of what we're trying to do is about building some broad-based collective power and the two key elements in our way of thinking of, orga of power are organized people and organized money. Um, so we ask every member congregation to do two things uh, to contribute in, into each of those things. Uh, organized people, uh, in our language, we call it taking the form of a core team, which is a handful of people. Sometimes it's an ad hoc team. Sometimes it's a pre-existing team that the congregation all, already has. But basically, it's five to 10 people who take responsibility for being the glue between their congregation and the broader organization and making it a two-way relationship, right? They're the ones who will help to organize. Matt, we lost your audio somehow. Alana, do you want to jump in now while we wait for Matt to get his sure. audio back? Sure. Hopefully, um, Matt can get his voice back soon um, because he's certainly the better qualified person to talk about some of these details, especially organized money. But I will. Um, I'll just share a little bit about why I became involved in Connect at TE and how that came to be, um, and. Um, you know, uh, hopefully we can both answer questions that you have. So I, um, <clears throat> you know, like many of you, I'm sure central to my um, Jewish identity is this idea of tikkun olam, repair of the world. Um, and for me, I really wanted that work that I, that I engaged in with my synagogue to be more than just charitable work. <clears throat> but most of what we do is uh, charitable. Um, not all of what we do, but there's many charitable sort of um, ways of getting involved in most synagogues. Um, and <clears throat> I um, have been working since 2011 um, at Yale on research related to mass incarceration, housing, um, the lack of affordable housing, a lack of any housing for some people, um, and how this impacts on health. And the way we study this is um, several ways, but one of them was interviewing people over time after their release from prison. And I was really beginning to get to know people very well and seeing their struggles, trying to get housing and trying to get a job uh, with a criminal record. And it was just so uh, punishing beyond, you know, their, their sentence and beyond what had been given to them as sort of their, uh, their sentence. And um, <clears throat> it was very much related, their crimes were usually related very much to poverty, very much to mental health issues, very much to substance use issues. And um, these are all obviously structural problems. It, it was affecting, you know, most of the people that I interviewed were people of color. Um, and uh, in order to fix the sort of structural problem, we need structural solutions. And I wanted to be part of that. And I didn't know how to do that alone. <laughs> My work wasn't really helping me. We were writing papers, but it wasn't action. It wasn't action focused. And that was frustrating to me. Um, and I also felt as a white person who has been privileged by my race and also as a researcher who has sort of been privileged by studying um, sort of these injustices, it was sort of my, my sort of feeling and just kind of uh, need to do something on a structural level. Um, and so <clears throat> even before I, my synagogue was TE, I wanted um, to have this role and be, it, be connected to my Jewish identity. Um, but it was really overwhelming to think of how I would do that or how I would get other synagogue, other Jewish people to be involved in that. And so um, connect, um, 
Great, Matt, you can hear again. Um, so Connect um, had been courting Temple Emmanuel when I was a relatively new member. And so when I learned about Connect's mission, especially their Clean Slate campaign um, that Matt's described to wipe clean criminal records of people after uh, a certain amount of time has passed, I was sort of all in. And I just suddenly found myself sort of chair of Connect at TE. We had a probationary or like a trial year where we tried it out to see it's kind of a sort of a different kind of relationship. So like I'm sure many of you didn't know what to expect. Um, so Connect was very flexible with us and we had sort of started I think as a trial year and then we sort of ramped up and saw how much interest, you know, we just sort of said, let's see how much interest there would be. And we have um, had, uh, you know, success in, in developing. I don't, I, I've never called it a core team but we certainly have a group of five to 10 people who uh, participate in many of the Connect events, um, and some of the some of those people are involved in the criminal justice reform team. I have a wonderful co-chair, Jean Silk, which many of you may know as the uh, director of JCAR, and I think that's one of just many uh, relationships that I've built through Connect within my congregation. And these relationships are based on the, sort of this common passion for social justice, and I think it's one of the sort of more uh, <clears throat> sort of unexpected benefits of belonging and I think it's intergenerational where uh, sometimes our connect has been separated um, by generations. We have the sort of the Sunday school <laughs> parent group um, and then we have sort of people who are, who are longer time members and this has been a nice bridge I think in that regard. Um, and uh, so I would just say that more than um, you know the commitment that I have or you know in times of time uh, or anything else really to connect. I feel like I've gotten so much more from connect. I mean, I have learned now about the legislative process. I've given testimony. I've talked to my representatives. I know who my representatives are and my senators. Um, I, um, I have built these relationships. I know what relational power is. I don't do as many relational power meetings, which we call one-on-one, one-to-one, one-on-one meetings with um, members across congregations and within your congregation to learn more about what makes you um, want to do this work and what what issues you're passionate about. That's sort of one of the core activities that we're engaged with, uh, engaged in as Connect members. So it's always in the back of my head to do more of those, but I can say that the relationships and the people that I've talked to has made my, my life so much better, you know, just knowing um, people and I feel you know, much more fulfilled as a person, just having gone through the clean slate process and made some um, made some kind of impact. Connect uh, clean slate to me, I'll say, is really imperfect. Um, it's a compromise. It leaves a lot of people out. But for years and years, you know, I was in the reentry space, seeing people come out of prison, and it just was sort of like a cyclical conversation, and nothing was ever done. And we have all these congregations who were able to come together and compromise and have the power and the motivation and the organization to do something about it. So I can't say enough about Connect. I'm a proud member and um, it has, you know, I could talk about, you know, how we how we operate, but maybe um, it'll just be good to let Matt finish if he has the sound back and also then we can turn to Q&A. Thanks, Alana. Sorry, everybody, for that glitch. I think it may be that I have two teenage daughters at home doing homework and getting online, and they finished eating. And I so anyway, I hope we want I won't have any more glitches. Um, yeah. So I think I was just talking about core teams and kind of you know a handful of organized people in each congregation helping to make the glue between the congregation and the larger organization, making sure that it's a two-way conversation and congregations. Right. We're a small d democratic organization right so it's our membership that helps determine what the agenda of the organization is and for that to actually happen we need a few people to you know be the point people to really have a lot of conversations in in your congregation and then represent those interests in the broader organization and vice versa when we're in work when we're in action when we're working on a campaign whatever that might be um, or multiple campaigns because we typically have multiple issues going on at the same time that there are a handful of people from each congregation that are trying to be involved in the work and get knowledgeable about it and can bring that information back to the congregation, keep people up to speed uh, to some extent, 
and then call forth, right? Part of organized power is we don't get 800 people to the assembly because just the core teams come. It's because the core teams have done good work, kept people apprised of what's going on and said, hey, we need a lot more people to come out to be able to uh, force the candidates for governor or whatever it might be to, to come forward and deal with us and take our questions seriously. So a congregation or a core team of five or 10 might then be able to bring, depending on how long they've been at it and how hard they've been at it, they might bring 20 people, 25 people, you know, some of our congregations, uh, B'nai Israel, the host uh, down in Bridgeport of that, uh, that action, I think had over 125 of their members at that assembly. Uh, now being on home field advantage doesn't hurt, of course, but uh, it was also a lot of work over a lot of years to build that kind of following up inside the congregation for them to be able to turn that number of people out. Um, and then secondly, the other piece, the organized money piece is that we ask all the congregations to help pay, pay the bill, right? Pay, pay membership dues to help fund the organization. That's the foundation of our budget. Um, we have a rule that we take no government funds, right? We wanna be an independent organization that is run and directed by its membership. Um, so we take no government money. Um, we're we're self-funded uh, through dues. And uh, about five years ago, we started an, an individual donor campaign. So those are two big sources of our budget. And then we raise some additional grant funds uh, from foundations that either like this kind of work or maybe uh, see a track record of work on an issue that uh, they particularly support. So we've gotten, for instance, on healthcare, we've gotten funding from the Connecticut Health Foundation. Um, so that's sort of how we we fund the organization and um, some of our rabbinic leaders at the founding of the organization as the clergy were trying to determine how to determine dues uh, said, well, why don't we talk about the payas of the fields, the Leviticus, Leviticus 19 commandment to leave the corner of the field for the poor to glean, which is codified as 160th. So that's our dues yardstick. We ask congregations to talk to us about what their budget is and do the calculation with us of what is 160th of, of that budget. And then we talk, right? Um, but that gives us at least a measurement to go to every congregation and have uh, a conversation about how do we contribute our fair share. Um, when some congregations do that calculation, you know, the number is big and they, are aghast and, and sometimes want to run away. And I say, no, we negotiate. Let's talk about it. Let's make it reasonable and sustainable. Um, so it's a more an aspirational target than an act, you know, than, than something that every congregation is doing. Um, but you know, especially at the founding where we're heavily Christian and Jewish. And so turning to turning to the text made a lot of sense and and has made sense ever since. So that's how we calculate the dues. Uh, and ask congregations to, to you know, work with us on that. And um, I think uh, I'm sure there's lots, you know, lots more we could talk about. But but I'll just shut up at that point and see what questions are. Well, I wanted to um, folks may have. I wanted to invite Rabbi Woodward. I understand you have some experience with an organization like this in another community. And would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's so, I mean, it's so much fun to hear about this. So um, in Ohio, um, I used to be a rabbi in Columbus, Ohio, and we were super involved with an organization called BRED, um, which stands for Building Respect, um, Equality, and Dignity, which operated um, with the same model as Connect. So BRED um, united 55 different houses of worship, synagogues, um, churches, and mosques in the area. And it really advocated for very, very similar things um, as you know that we see here in Ohio. Um, some of those were at the county level, some of those were at the state level. It was a great way of meeting people from other places. Um, our synagogue was one of the sort of founding synagogues of it and was really involved. So we would often host, um, the sort of big gatherings at our synagogue. Um, and it was a really cool way of doing it. Um, and it engaged a lot of people. Um, one thing that was really cool about it is that I think people have a, a desire um, to, I don't have a better 
way of saying this, a desire to, to do tikkun olam, a desire to improve the world, but it often has trouble instantiating into something, right? Like it's easy to give a sermon about this or to think, oh gosh, we should do something about this. But it's hard to know, like when you're faced with a sort of enormity of the tasks facing us. And I think that these organizations are really powerful because for one thing, they, they're like force multipliers, right? They recognize that we're actually not the only people who are feeling this, but a lot of people um, are feeling this way and they get people together. Um, and you see sometimes, you know, articles about like the growth of the religious left. And the reality is that the religious left has been out there for a long time doing this sort of work. Um, but that we often forget that there are other people who are doing this and we think that we're just sort of on our own. It's also a great um, spiritual lesson, I think an ego lesson to realize that um, we aren't the only people who care about this, but there are actually other people doing great work about this and we can be, there's something very empowering about sometimes being a foot soldier in something that a bunch of people have organized. Um, I think that's a great model. Um, and, you know, it was fun. Like you would really, like, I mean, it's hard to explain that, but, you know, Matt, when you were talking about all those people packed in the room to hear um, the governor talk about um, the clean slate thing, you said it was 85 degrees in there. Like those are exciting moments when you come together. I remember, you know, we all came together to, um, it, one of the big things was to hear the sort of county sheriff um, whether he would accept a new form of ID. Um, it, it was, it's a complicated thing, but it was something for immigrants to increase the chance that maybe they wouldn't be deported in an interaction with the police. And, you know, he said yes to some things and no to other things. And they're on stage and everybody's there. And we're not supposed to, I think we weren't supposed to boo, but we were supposed to be kind of like shocked and silent when something went wrong. Um, it was really hard not to boo. Um, and, but it was like a very powerful moment. And I think eventually they did make this change. And it's the thing where it's like, I could give a million sermons about this issue and do nothing. And I could have, you know, the whole Hebrew school writing these things, but like the actual pressure to make these changes that actually improve people's lives is something that you can only do with these sort of networks like this. Um, so it's a great, um, it's just a great model for this. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I guess what we'll do now is open up for questions and comments. And if people want have a question or comment, you can go down to the reactions button and hands up like Donna just did. And we'll try to call on you in order to the best of our ability. Donna, can you unmute, unmute and tell us what's on your mind? Sure. Um, well, I'm, I'm the Becky finance chair, so so you can hear that. But so I, I have some questions just in terms of how you compute the the one sixtieth and for a starting point, is it the entire budget or just dues of the members or how, that? And then my the second question, more importantly, is just I I know there's restrictions on nonprofits lobbying. And I'm sure you've already vetted all of that, but I'd like to hear about that. Sure. So we be we we generally talk to congregations about both of those numbers. What is the whole budget number, as well as what is kind of the you know dues member the dues income or the membership income? You know, depending obviously on what tradition or denomination you are, that's going to come in in different ways. But. Um, uh, you know that many times that's a conversation that you know is is about is helpful in figuring out what's a number that's reasonable and sustainable. Um, so I think we'd be interested in, in you know in in knowing both numbers to be able to do the math with you and have a conversation, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, the um, question about lobbying, is, yes, of course, we're a nonprofit, nonprofit 501c3, and we have limitations on how much lobbying we can do um, and are, are conscientious about that and, and track those hours. Um, you know, the, the IRS, I'm not going to remember off the top of my head the exact percentage the IRS, you know, talks about, but it does not prohibit us as a 501c3 from doing any lobbying. It just prohibits us from doing that at, you know, like 
20% full time or like, yeah, I think it's about 20%. Um, yeah. So uh, we're well as, under anything coming close to that in terms of the actual member, amount of time. Uh, sure. If uh, as a member organization, is our, is our, do we have to track our time that we're committing to connect in terms of lobbying or that no. doesn't, no. No, we as a connect organization do and largely what is rele most relevant to the IRS is the amount of time that paid staff people are doing lobbying, which a very literal definition is that you're talking to a legislator, a public official directly in favor of something or against something, a specific piece of legislation. So, um, so it does not implicate any of our member congregations, you know, at all in terms of their status. And, and we track and are careful and conscientious about it, but come nowhere close to, you know, going over those limits. Can I add a third question while I'm unmuted? Which, uh, <laughs> just, well, Alana mentioned a provisional member congregation. Can you tell us what that involves, um, being a provisional? That's member? actually, it's, I mean, that's, no, there's nothing, no official provisional membership status. That's that was. It, it's more that you know, uh, we've said to some new congregations or congregations that are considering it, try it for a year. Right? It's hard. Or uh, you know, in normal times, I would say, come to an assembly, <laughs> and certainly you could come to an assembly on Zoom. But you know, actually being in the room and experiencing um, some some moment when we're all together doing something uh, very often helps. Uh, people get a, you know, get a better feel for what all this is, um, as opposed to hearing about it. Now, uh, we've got a whole YouTube channel full of videos of our, almost every assembly we've done since COVID struck. So yeah, I can certainly share that with folks if anybody wants to watch one. But um, uh, there's not an official status of a provisional membership as much as that we've encouraged and invited congregations that are interested, but not 100% sure to try it for a year. And I think in TE's case, and I, uh, I'm, I think other cases, it's, it's ended up being a good experience and people have wanted to stay and wanted to keep at it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, Judy, you had your hand up, I think. Yeah, I think Carol's, I, and my hand was up and down. I was okay. going to address Don, one of Donna's questions about okay. the 501c3, just having been an, you know, an attorney at New Haven Legal Assistance and Amy Marks, who's not on tonight, would also be able to, to substantiate this. I mean, there are a lot of systemic legislative issues that go on and, and you know, I'd, I'd be up at the legislature. We had a paid lobbyist also that, but if any one of us as, as attorney or paralegal or advocate staff people, you know, were at the legislature more than a specific amount. We just had to register as lobbyists. I don't, that would not happen, you know, as any one of us, us congregants personally, individually. And it never, ever, ever affected, you know, New Haven Legal Assistance 5013C status. So that's, that was my comment. And I had put my hand down on, on that. Um, Carol, why don't, yeah, why don't you, and then, and then I'll just sort of have a general comment about my willingness to sort of be a, be, be a core person, so. <laughs> okay, um, I have two questions. The first is, um, I'm wondering if there was a way that you were relating to the ACLU of Connecticut in terms of criminal justice reform, because that's been a big project of theirs as well. And yeah, my absolutely. second question- Oh, sorry. And my, well, I'll, yeah, and my second question is, I'm wondering where issues are generated. Are they? I, I understand they're generated from the congregations, from the people who are interested. But some of us are living in insulated world. Um, if the if the issues are um, more broad, and if so, how do they come to us, and how do they come to the congregations and connect? You you went on mute for one second, and I think you you were saying. Oh. So the, the congregations are sometimes insulated or siloed. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. I think we as we live in silos basically, and congregations are siloed some, and to some extent. And I mean, sure. certainly we're not in 
in touch unless we're in touch other ways, like in our professions with people yeah. who are not part of our island of comfort and um, familiarity. And I, so I wonder uh, about the issues and where they uh, are generated and how gotcha. they are generated. Um, and then about so, you and how, how you relate, might have related to them in terms of criminal, criminal justice reform. Yeah, so real quickly on ACLU, they were we were huge allies and um, worked very closely with them, uh, especially the second two years of the Clean Slate campaign. Um, but even as we were doing research on the landscape of criminal justice issues in Connecticut, we, they were one of the first groups we talked to. Um, so we were in conversation with them, you know, I would say from start to finish of the uh, Clean Slate campaign, and they were uh, huge and important allies uh, in helping to get it passed. Um, so they were very good partners. Um, and um, in terms of uh, issue generation and silos, um, and, and Alana, please jump in here if you if you want to answer it from your perspective and experience. But I, part, I think there's two, two pieces, right? Um, one is we ask you to dig into your own silo and really look at what's there. Um, and often, e uh -oh. even in congregations, in privileged congregations, did I, did you lose me? Just back there. Just in yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't happen again. Um, but anyway, in, in, in some of our, you know, seemingly most privileged congregations, when we actually get people sitting down in house meetings and small group conversations and, you know, asking what's really going on or what's really affected them, we find that there are, there's real pain, there's real hurt, there's real issues right there. They may not get talked about every, every weekend after services, or they may not be on the surface, or, or there may even be active attempts to keep them below the surface, right? Out of sort of shame or fear or what have you. Um, but, you know, we have stories of gun violence out of you know, and the impact of gun violence on, on families in white suburban congregations. We've had stories of criminal records and how they've affected people out of some of our synagogues. We have stories of un, being uninsured and unemployed out of, you know, Westport Everywhere. congregations, right? So sometimes it's about digging deeper or, or just creating the space for people to, you know, really share some of what's either going on right now or what has happened to them that's against stereotype. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece is, you know, um, part of the benefit of being in the mixed organization with lots of different types of people is to be able to hear about experiences and stories that are different and you might not otherwise run into. Um, and when that happens, part of what we'll do is take a lot of time to have internal conversations to get people to not, not only understand an issue from a policy perspective, but why it's important to your fellow member of Connect. So some of the stuff I talked about early on around immigration uh, and the undocumented was not a universal experience. It was not something that, you know, uh, there were undocumented people in every congregation, um, but it was young people who were either, you know, graduating high school or even college age who hadn't been able to go to college, who went around from their church to a whole bunch of other churches and congregations and synagogues and told their stories and talked about what their experience was and answered questions and you know sometimes hard questions sometimes not very terribly friendly questions but um really you know did the work internally to see could they get the whole organization and all its congregations to support them and because they did that work and because you know they were really compelling young people who were just trying to get on with their life uh, many having, you know, been, you know, here from a very young age, um, everybody got to yes and said, yes, let's fight for that, Let, you know, and, you know, obviously in a lot of the Jewish community, there's a tremendous resonance with immigrant, resonant, resonance with immigrant issues. Um, so some congregations, it was very quick, were very quick to get to yes. Um, some of our Black congregations had the hardest time. Um, and I won't go into the long story, but one of the experiences in one of our key black congregations was uh, one of our strong leaders 
being antagonistic to, to some of the immigrant leaders trying to get support around uh, driver's licenses, only to have a deacon in her own church pull her aside and said, say, why do you think I get rides everywhere I go? Why do you think I need a ride to church on Sunday? Uh, says the, the Jamaican born deacon in her own church, right? So another moment when it's transformed to othering you know, the others, us versus them, to uh, unexpectedly inside of our own community and congregation. Um, so I don't know if that, I've lost you on my screen. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that, there you are. Um, I don't know if that helps answer the question, but I think, um, I think it's, it's both, both and from my perspective. And I would just add that I think that part of our identities as people oftentimes are our professional identities. I mean, I see it at Steve from Desk and Judy is from New Haven Legal Assistance and I work at Yale as a researcher on criminal legal uh, issues. And so I feel like we bring, we, I, I can't believe the amount of people I've met at Temple Emanuel who work in, you know, healthcare who care deeply about these issues and education who care deeply about these issues. You know, um, so many people just, it's a different angle, but it's, it's still, it's still who we are, right? Fundamentally. So I think issues can come up that way too, or we at least can um, kind of join in on that front. Thank you. Um, Ellen or Steve, one of you had a question or a comment? Unmute. Thanks very much. I have a question. You mentioned churches and synagogues, any mosques? I'm having a hard time hearing you, Steve. I think he was asking about mosques. And we do and have- Synagogues and churches were all mosques. Yes. Yes, we, um, as Alana said, we have uh, members that are mosques, um, uh, Quaker Meeting House, a Unitarian Church, a Sikh Temple, and I feel like I'm forgetting one more. Um, the majority certainly is, you know, are, are the Abrahamic faith, right, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, but um, we even have some beyond that as well. And Steve uh, Worland. Thanks, uh, Matt. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Alana, thanks for coming tonight. Um, as I, I have two questions, I guess. Um, well, the first one, uh, it seemed that most of the issues are, are statewide issues, and I, I don't know, I may have missed this if you said it, but do you ever do um, more local issues, whether it has to do with, you know, uh, working with municipalities or working with uh, faith-based groups within a certain um, city or within sort of a greater, I'm thinking New Haven, so like a greater New Haven uh, region to, uh, to lobby toward city hall or the mayor's office or, or a local alders? Yes, absolutely. Um, we don't do it in every city that we're in all the time, but where there we have, you know, enough of a base of membership and leadership and interest uh, and, and, and issues, right? I, I feel like we kind of work to hear the stories and follow them to where they most make sense and lead. Um, right, you get into criminal justice quickly, you're at the state level, at least in Connecticut. Um, but lots of other issues don't necessarily lead that way. So in fact, on September 1st, we had a joint Hamden New Haven um, candidate assembly uh, for the candidates for mayor. Um, that was kind of a, an experiment. We had a hybrid. We had people in person at Congregation Mishkan Israel in Hamden, and then on Zoom as well. Um, and uh, about 200 people uh, attended between the two. And, you know, at the time we planned it, of course, Mayor Elliker had an opponent and we had a little bit more of a dynamic mayor's race in New Haven than we do now. But regardless, we got him to come out and we had the three um, candidates on the primary ballot in, in Hamden, um, where we were able to ask for commitments around, uh, in New Haven, it was around asthma, uh, gun violence and um, improvements on street safety in Fairhaven neighborhood. Um, but that's really was developed by a handful of, you know, a leadership team of leaders from congregations in those two towns, figuring out um, what do we want to work on. Cool. Can, can I ask one more question? Um, is that okay? 
Um, yeah, so the, my other question, a uh, little bit more of a touchier one. Um, I know you, you said at the, at the beginning that, um, you know, that, that you're a nonpartisan group and that the issues you tend to, that you deal with, you know, do cross a political divide. Um, that said, I mean, you know, just, just looking at the issues you're dealing with, especially at the state, state level, um, when they do sort of lean one direction, they are leaning left. Um, and, and I think Rabbi Woodward sort of alluded to that, you know, the, the religious left. Um, I, I, I think, you know, at Becky, I think what I've found over recent years is that, you know, Becky is not as, as monolithic as, politically, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, well, just, just in terms of politics, um, as maybe we tend to think it is. Um, but I mean, do, does Connect get involved in that? I mean, do you, I mean, how do you navigate sort of the internal politics of some of these congregations? Do you find that it's, diff that, that it can create strife within congregations or it, has that, has that been a non-issue or just an issue that, that Connect doesn't sort of, you know, has to steer clear of, you know, from your part? Um, I think it's, it's, very frankly, been something that people fear more than actually happened. Um, and I think the few times that we have, you know, in a congregation, somebody saying, I personally object <laughs> to that issue. Um, the biggest part of what, what gets us to yes there, and this is actually the case with a recent past president of B'nai Israel, right? Where I showed you the photo where we hosted, you know, who hosted and had such a tremendous turnout and we have tremendous buy-in from that congregation. The president, a couple, of, uh, I'm not gonna remember if it's one president ago or two, but in any event, very conservative guy um, and ideologically opposed a number of the issues that, that we took on, but he'd been part of conversations, he'd been, asked himself what he cared about. He'd seen the core team in his own congregation engaging the membership of the congregation and understood that we were doing that across congregations. And it wasn't, you know, something we were just foisting on, a, on the congregation to do that we had come up with, but that his own uh, fellow congregants had been involved from beginning to end in terms of developing it. So, you know, he, he personally wasn't super excited, but he understood where it came from and he understood how many people in his congregation cared about and were involved and said, good for you. And in some respects was a grudging fan of ours, is a grudging fan of ours, even if it wouldn't have been his agenda that he chose. Um, so um, so I, I think, you know, when and if it does come up that, that issues or specific things are are potentially divisive or concerning. I think our biggest strategy is let's talk about it. We want to hear from you. We're not going to run from that. We want to go toward that and and hear it out and have the conversation and try to figure out it, you know where it's really coming from and and can we find our way to to either compromise or to to yes. And the, is that is that something that connect facilitates? And, and and part of the reason I ask this is because it has come up in recent years where we have had some di um, divisive issues, and um, you know we've we've kind of taken the approach that that I think that 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 you're describing. Um, it can be a heavy lift to take that approach. I mean, it's time consuming and, and, and to organize that and to and you know conversations are, are not easy. So um, yeah, I mean, how, I guess my question is, how involved do 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 you all get in that? Do you help? to sort of navigate those conversations on the internal pieces? I would say as involved as we need to be, right? I mean, I think we would defer and work through the, whatever the core leaders, the key leaders, the core leaders that are in that congregation and, and try to advise them to be prudent and you know thoughtful and respectful in the way they approach it. But I think we'd work, you know, try to help them navigate it. And then if they needed more help to get more involved. Thank you very much. Donna. Unmute. Yeah, so, um, Steve asked my question, but I, but I, you know, since my hand was already raised, <laughs> uh, let, let's take it a little further because that's actually the biggest concern. We have a very, um, well, we're Jewish, you know, like there's a lot of opinions and, <laughs> and, and very strong opinions about things and things one might think that would be easily supportive 
Um, we have had, you know, social justice type issues in some cases. We have had members say, if you do that, we're quitting, quitting our membership and that kind of thing. So I understand what you were saying about the president of B'nai Israel who was actually involved, but if we have a core group of five or 10 people that are involved or maybe even more come to the meetings, and I don't know whether it's a vote or a consensus or how you agree on an issue, which seems perfectly reasonable to the people involved. I, I, mean, I am concerned that it'll come back and it'll become a whole big brouhaha with some of our members. And there'll be, if, you, if we stay in connect, you know, we're quitting this congregation and that sort of thing. I don't know if you've ever seen that or, or what, what I, others think I, about I've it. I've yeah. never seen it get to that level or, or get to, you know, where that thread you is You haven't leveled. been at Becky. <laughs> 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 um, I, I mean, I, I certainly want to uh, stipulate that, you know, we have congregations, member congregations that are very polyglot politically too, right? Um, so that would not be unique. Um, but um, I've, I've, again, feel like that fear has been greater than the reality. Um, you know, I can't promise anything, right? I mean, I, I suppose it could happen, um, but our approach is relational and to engage and to talk and not to try to ram something through. Um, Go ahead, Alana. So are there votes or do, do you vote on issues or how, how does that? Yeah, so the, um, the, the organization comes together periodically through the year in larger meetings we call delegates assemblies where all the member congregations, you know, come and are present. And depending on kind of where we are in that cycle of organizing that I was talking about, um, coming out of, you know, doing research work we would we would have issue teams at their at the appropriate point when they're ready right present an issue what what have they come up with what do they want to work on and depending on you know how complex it is or difficult to understand it may take one or two you know more than one sit down right more than one meeting but there'd be an opportunity for the whole membership to hear about it to ask questions um and uh to and to either assent or dissent um about going forward. Um, but usually that only happens after a considerable amount of work and usually pre-work so that people don't come into the room just hearing about it for the first time. They've had a, a chance to but, hear about it and study it. But how do the, the member congregations know if, if it, I, I was like, what is the representation? Is it, you know, um, has the, have the member congregations previously presented and polled their congregants or just sort of said, well, you're welcome to come to, or to this meeting or how, totally, how do we totally. avoid, or how do we find out how our congregants feel about a particular issue if there is dissent? It totally would depend on how your congregation operates, right? Or how your, what you need to do for your congregation. And we would try to accommodate the time and space to make sure you could do that, right? So we've had, and you know, this is not quite the same thing, but in terms of memberships and congregations joining, right? Depending on the tradition, it's sometimes one person's decision, right? A, a Catholic pastor, um, in many cases says yes or no, and that's it. We've had whole congregational votes where the entire congregation votes on whether they're gonna join or not. So, you know, we've got night and day there in terms of the, culture and the way the congregation operates um and uh and so you know we would we would work with you and rely on you to know how you need to operate in your own congregation to figure it out thank you cynthia hi okay um thanks this has been really wonderful so i have my question really was um what alana talked about with interconnections, I found really interesting that kind of sparked my thoughts. And I am wondering if, first of all, between congregations, um, particularly, I think that it's that Jewish congregations are predominantly 
white of one form or another and getting to know people who are from different backgrounds. If there's specific projects that people can work on, not necessarily be in a leadership role, but say, let's just bring people together. If any of that has happened. And then part of this question is also, can that happen with the youth, um, the youth groups too? So that's my question. Has that happened? Is that a possibility? Just say, we're gonna have this one project volunteer for this one thing and you'll get to know people. Is there any record of that? speak about um, we've had for the last few years uh, regional team meetings so um, congregations in the New Haven area have gotten together and during those meetings there's an opportunity to talk with members of other congregations and also exchange contact information and in fact it's one of the actual sort of uh, requests of the leaders at the meeting that you make a plan to do a, uh, a conversation to have a sit down or a conversation on Zoom with somebody from another congregation. Um, and I have met through the criminal justice reform team, I have met other people um, from different congregations who I've talked to about, we had, for example, we had subcommittees trying to decide um, what other, besides Clean Slate, what we wanted to work on. And so we were, you know, we had three different subcommittees. One of them was on uh, conditions of incarceration. So there were, you know, a handful of us that were interested in talking about that. And I got to know some people through that. I mean, I think, um, you know, the beauty of Connect is that it's just so variable. Like, you know, I could be a full-time Connect organizer. There's just so much work to do and there's so many relationships to form. And so if you, you know, have the time and inclination, you can be, you know, making um, lots of connections and doing so much, but it's also not a requirement to be involved and you do what you can as your time allows. So I would say that, yeah, there's definitely relationships um, across different congregations. I think it's something we could always improve upon. I think that um, one thing that we do talk about is the tension. Um, I, I think a lot of the white organizations do. Um, it, it is an appeal of Connect that allows us sort of sort of to get to know people from different walks of life, but it's it can be burdensome for other um, some of the uh, people um, who are minorities and come from um, minority churches and other congregations. And so I think we're conscious of that and try, you know, there's certainly a time and a place and a reason um, for connections. Um, there's also a black caucus, I think, right, Matt, um, where people can work on things. I've thought, I've thought about <laughs> how neat it would be to have a Jewish caucus to talk about things that are really um, so important to us as Jewish people in the particular kind of tensions and decisions um, and ethics of being Jewish and Connecticut, you know, um, but that, of course, is not not something, but it's something that Connect would allow for, you know, if, if there was ever leadership on, on that front. Okay, so I, my question was more thinking about people who are not, who don't have a lot of time and don't want to take on leadership positions, um, but can join in little ways. So, you know, that's just... And meet people, and surely meet people and connect with them and hear their stories, for sure. And contribute. Okay. So that's, yeah. And what about youth? And with youth groups? So one of the most amazing Connect members I met was a youth member um, from the um, mosque in um, Bridgeport who I met at a, at a training and she was in high school and just talked um, so eloquently about her sort of passion for um, social justice and her experiences being so different from her um, classmates and I think that that's, uh, there was a training this fall, right, for youth, um, and I don't know much about it, but I know there's a presence and a desire to do more with youth. Okay. Yeah, we did, a, we did an experimental training over the summer um, for young people that was not big, but, you know, was more a test, and so I think it went well, and there's interest to try to build upon that and, and see if we can offer, perhaps in the winter, again, an opportunity to bring youth from different uh, congregations. We'll see where we are, right? But it may very well be on Zoom, just given the pandemic. Um, but so there's there's interest, there's been a little bit of dabbling, but we don't have like a full-fledged youth program um, at this stage. Okay, thanks. 
Judy. Thanks. Um, Donna, I had a follow up or as, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about it to your question of, of you know, political in, intransigence or, con or conflict um, with Becky. Um, I'd like to th express it this way, um, that connects process or advocacy mode. I mean, I, and what appeals to me, as you would understand, um, as 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 an attorney, as an ad, retired attorney, as an advocate, is is the advocacy that Connect does. That it's action advocacy. I mean, we have Sadaka and charity, and I participate in that. But advocacy is extremely important to me. Um, but I wanted to distinguish between the the process being a pol the process of Connect is through politics, is through is through legislative action or that kind of advocacy and it ends up with political bodies because that's how we're structured but the issues and the concerns if we if we talk about them right are not necessarily political in and of themselves and i think that's something to be able to express to members who have concerns and don't you know immediately think oh it's political but if you think about let's say the work that might, you know, the issues that might have arisen or become to our awareness at Becky, let's say with, I'm coming back to Amy, you know, Amy Marks being such a strong advocate um, around lead, you know, health and lead, lead pain issues through New Haven Legal Assistance. Um, you know, that isn't a political issue. It ends up being a very local, the local method besides litigation you know, was was political in terms of the methodology, but when you talk about you know lead-based paint and the ramifications on the community, whether it's people in our congregation in in rental housing or people outside the congregation, it's a it's a, it's a human issue. And so, if we learn how to express certain issues as human issues, that ultimately get acted on through a through political process, I think it might take the scariness or the divisiveness away. I, I would hope. And, and if I, you know, if I'm in a core position and learning how to see things like that, that's how I would try to to describe that kind of situation and, and bring bring that can bring understanding and and hope to eliminate that kind of divisiveness. Yeah, and just to you know, step in on that, um, it's, not, it's not even the political. I mean, I was, Steve and I were both on the board when an issue came up that um, uh, I think with, with uh, police using the building for, uh, oh. uh, yeah, or uh, whatnot. Sure. And, and, you know, it wasn't a political issue or anything. It was people's sensitivities that, that differed surprisingly to me i mean i'm all for all i i love the things connect does and all but it would not surprise me if there were people who said there were landlords in our our congregation who didn't want to pay for this lead paint reduction and say if you stay in that organization that's doing that politics we're quitting becky i don't think there's a lot of that and it, it, it obviously would be handled sensitively but I, I do think even not political issues, even people see social justice differently sometimes. And, I, you know, I did attend a meeting. I don't know if it was the same one Judy attended initially where a bunch of congregations were invited to a connect meeting um, to, as an introduction about a year ago. And um, that's what worried me about it. <laughs> Cause I, I heard that and I was like, hmm, there's people in our congregation that aren't going to want to be roped into something that's not exactly the way they want it to be. That even if it's good, and even if this larger organization is seeing it, that was my concern. I don't know if it would happen, and you know, but I, I think everybody should realize that. I'm going to jump in and say two things. One is we're running over time. 
Mm -hmm. Two is these are questions really that are internal questions. If a decision is made for us to join connect, I think we'll have to talk about how we make it feel uh, that it involves that people feel comfortable and involved. Um, But, you know, we can't figure that out tonight. That's going to obviously, and I don't think connect can figure that out for us. I think they may have some experience with it, but that's going to be an internal issue. So Absolutely. that's what I would say about that. I just that. wanted to raise that. No, it's, a, it's what, definitely what worth the thinking about. Might be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Steve, I, I would, oh, sorry. I just to say, you know, this is a this is a real issue to grapple with in the sense of what do you want your congregation to be and to be about, mm-hmm. um, and if it's a community that has a tradition that it's called to act on. Um, that, help, that that's the work of getting to collective judgment and collective action. And we live in a culture that is so rife with us all being entitled to our opinion and our individual stand. And um, of course, you know, that, that's in all of our congregations, but can you create maybe, you know, you already have, but maybe through this work, continue to create a conversation about what do we want to be in the world and in our community and, can that ever be about collective action? Um, and if it can't, I would, I just think that's a little bit sad um, and, and disappointing, right? Um, we need more congregations that can get to yes and say, yes, we wanna be a community, um, not just to, you know, um, uh, to, to help us and support us and, uh, when we're down and when things are, you know, hard for our, our family or our loved ones or what have you, but also that can lift us up to be able to raise our voices and take our values outside the four walls and make an impact. Um, And lots of people, as somebody said, right, do that in their own ways in their own professional lives. But again, that's individual. And so what the opportunity in organizing is, is to figure out how can you be in collective action as a community, um, you know, fulfilling the mission of your congregation, not just to raise up the next generation of Jews, but to show them what it's really about. Um, And, you know, that's not for every congregation, right? I don't mean to say you must do this or you even should do this. You need to make that judgment. Um, But I think that that's the tension that we're kind of talking around. Um, And I think part of it is, is is casting that vision that we, that that being a part of this work is also about uh, making a statement about who we wanna be as a congregation. Um, how we want to be able to act together and act in our community. And I would say even before, you know, there's so much work before you act, right? And so much of that is education. And even if you just change two minds in your synagogue, you know, you've done so much work already and that's so valuable. And I think, you know, just having the conversations even, you know, and I think that it's not like everybody at TE is, uh, you know, not only is not everybody at TE involved in every committee, but um, there's no need for, you know, a congregation to be involved in every issue either, right? So there's so much flexibility. I mean, of course, we stand behind Connect all as a whole, but there's not, there's not like a mandate to do things that, you know, any particular person doesn't feel comfortable. But I think just, you know, expressing just how much those conversations in this day and age, how important they are, you know, for our just just to be human, you know, with each other. And so, yeah, I think that's one thing I really appreciate about Connect. Thank you. Steve? Well, we're, we're wrapping up, so, and I have a really mundane question that would have been such a nice place to end this. But uh, <laughs> so I, the, the only question I was going to ask was just about structure and, and um, you know, just piggybacking a little bit on what Cynthia asked. And I think what you've alluded to, Matt, a few times throughout. But, but I'm just curious as to kind of what, what is this, what is like full participation look like? I mean, if we have people in the, in the congregation who are really involved, what does that look like in terms of um, the structure of, of Connect and then how that trickles down to the congregations? Um, so I probably should add an organizational chart or something to that slideshow, right? Uh, but it's, it's a little messy and complex, but basically, um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we have these delegates assemblies where we invite everyone, you know, all the member congregations to come and participate periodically, usually two or three times a year. Um, sometimes they may have a issue, com- issue action component to them at times, but many times they're just internal meetings of the whole. 
um, where we're working on strategy and usually talking about issues or considering issues. Um, but uh, as Al Alana has referred to, you know, as people are moved and called, they're welcomed from any congregation to participate in the issue teams that get formed. So right now there's a criminal justice reform team, health, mental health team, and a gun violence team on a broad scale. And then as you asked about more local issues, right, on a more local level, um, there are different teams working on different issues in different uh, towns or areas. Um, so there's that piece. And then as Alana also referred to, we've created these regional gatherings just as a sort of geographic subset um, where people are, obviously with Zoom, it doesn't matter quite as much, but you know, very often those, geogra those uh, regional gatherings have literally been potlucks and places where people can break bread. And um, we do do some business, but it's also more of a community gathering uh, where people can delve a little deeper into conversation and relationship building. Um, and then last but not least, we have a strategy team. Um, and that is sort of like our board of directors. It's about 20 to 25 people. Um, some congregations have more than one person. Some congregations have no one on that strategy team. So it's not a representative body. It's the top leadership of the organization that is really charged with trying to um, think for the whole and, and as it says, strategize, right? Try to, uh, uh, you know, set the course of the organization overall. Um, so as congregations get more involved, as the leaders get more involved, you know, I'm always looking for good people who want to step onto the strategy team. It's not an, an exclusive club, but it is a, a place where obviously we're looking for people who are committed and really know the organization. Um, so I hope that's answered. I probably forget what, forgotten one aspect of structure, but I think I covered the lion's share of it. Thank you very much. Judy, did you, I know you've been waiting to share something with us. Unmute. It's a follow-up to what Steve thought was mundane, um, <laughs> which wasn't actually at all. And, it, you know, since we're wrapping up, I wanted to say that um, this connect, Becky becoming a part of Connect has been important to me for since I've learned about Connect through friends at Mishkan Israel. Um, I'd like Becky to, there are no congregations in New Haven in the city limits that are members of Connect, no, no, no synagogues. Um, there are no synagogues that are members of Connect in New Haven. Um, I think that's really something that's missing. Um, and um, I would like Becky, as Matt so well described in terms of you know the outlook of a synagogue i would like us as a synagogue to to have that kind of ethos where where we want to act collectively out in the community um so to that end i i've brought i've been following connect and i and i would like us to move forward and so i'm offering to to be um in the, to be a core leader um, I hope I would be joined by someone else and then others to pull together. Um, in the chat box, um, I have put my, just put my email address. So if you could please everybody look at the chat and note my email address, um, please send me an email if you would like to be, join me as part of a core group. I think that, I don't think we can do this unilaterally. I mean, I think the next thing is to take it to the board because of the, the obligation of becoming a member synagogue. That's not just having a committee. Um, and I'm certainly willing to talk, follow up with Rachel and, um, and Yaron to talk about, you know, going to the, and, and with the rabbi going to the board, um, if the rabbi is supportive of this, you know, and, and seeking official, um, uh, approval for Becky to become a member. So I'm, I'm willing to take on that role and please email me um, your willingness to, to work with me. And Judy, all, thank and you us. so much. That's, yeah. That is wonderful. Um, not only that you brought uh, Matt and Alana here tonight, you really were the, you know, the, the force behind this, but also that you're putting yourself out there that you would be willing to do the work and I do think people will join you. I think this is something that you know we need to talk about. Becky, yes, go on. Yes, yeah, yeah. There are others, and, and it's one of the reasons. I mean, I, I don't mean to be uninclusive. There are others. Uh, certainly, Rabbi Woodward has been extremely supportive and based on his experience with bread. Um, 
and uh, I, you know, I know of others who have been who have been interested in Connect, and I've reached out to the green team at Becky, and and um, an issue certainly that intersects. And Shoshana mm -hmm. and I talked before we all came on about intersections within Becky already of, of, of the kinds of interests that people have, and um, I think there's a lot that we can do to sort of bring some of those people together and and certainly certainly do do that so it's not just me it, there's lots of people i think that are that are interested in and would be involved yeah great thank you thank you very much i want to just um let people know that next week there is another schmooze same time wednesday at 7 30 uh and it'll be about fair trade food and why it is a jewish issue and the speaker is Susan Sklar, who's an interfaith team manager at Equal Exchange. Um, this is something that Becky May helped organize. Um, and I would encourage everybody to come and tell other people about it. It's going to be a similarly stimulating, interesting um, conversation with, I imagine, a lot of questions and talk. So sounds good. Um, Matt and Alana, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us tonight, and thank you for the work that you're doing to bring change to Connecticut, and uh, really appreciate everything that uh, you're doing. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Hi, Seth. Hi, Seth. Um, Hi, Steve. <laughs> And just saying thank you to Matt and Judy and Shoshana and Rachel and everybody's just, this is so wonderful. Hi. And Alana, thank you for joining us. It's just, this is really exciting. Hi, Steve. So. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night, and everyone. See you all soon, I'm sure. Stay yes. safe and be well. Hey, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.